All right, thank you. Welcome to this workshop. It's so nice to see so many of you here. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. My name is Fredrik Fralsen. I'm going to talk today about mainly AWS Lambda and a, a tool called Serverless Framework, which makes it uh, simpler to, to build serverless applications using uh, Lambda and other cloud services. Uh, we'll go through some of these topics um, how Serverless Framework helps us with configuration and deployment of our application. We'll see some examples of how we can build uh, different kinds of solutions using AWS Lambda, such as backend APIs or like REST services, for example. Uh, how we can do event processing. And we'll go into some uh, of these other topics as well, in terms of how you could orchestrate multiple functions uh, into a larger application. We'll touch on things like performance and some tips for packaging your application and testing. So this is a workshop, but it's, you can sort of, if you want, you can clone this repository from GitHub um, and follow along the code. Uh, if you want, you can set up your own free Amazon account to, to run things. But there are no exercises and such along the way. But we'll. Uh, um, yeah. Also, the slides are on the, uh, a link to the slides. A PDF is on that web page. So, um, who am I? My name is Fredrik. As I said, I come from Oslo in Norway, um, where I just well, since I was here last, I started working at the city government in Oslo as a data platform architect. Uh, but before then, I've been, I just realized when I was writing this talk that I've reached uh, a milestone. I've been now a professional developer for more than half my life. So that's, uh, yay. But I've been working um, mostly with like backend development, Java, and that kind of stuff. But in the past couple of years, working on data platform and data analysis. So what do we do uh, in the city government? Why are we building a data platform? And what does this have to do with Lambda and serverless? So the city provides a lot of services, a lot of different domains, for, ranging from like infrastructure, waterworks, and recycling and stuff, to healthcare and schools and kindergartens and, and whatnot. And um, currently, these are organized very much as silos. So there's little sort of collaboration between them in terms of uh, sharing data, sharing uh, services, and so on. So about two years ago, there was this vision called The Story of Tim. which is a, It's a YouTube video. It's in Norwegian, but it's subtitled, if you want to have a look at it. Um, essentially, they, we want to reshape how we provide services to the public. Um, essentially, the users, the citizens, should not have to care about how the government is organized. Um, so this entails having access to the data that you need when you need it, for example. Sharing, giving access to the ones that need it. Providing more personalized uh, content and services. And also proactive services so that we can act. You don't necessarily have to come to us. We can provide you services when we know that you need them, based on life events or things that happen where you live or other kinds of needs. And also, you should only need to sort of provide us with the data once as opposed to having to submit the same information multiple times and act as kind of a mailman between the different uh, parts of the city government. At least that's our, our vision. So we're building a data platform. We have a data lake in the middle here. And then, uh, we're very focused on things like uh, having control over our metadata. We have a lot of different data sources. So my previous company, we worked with ad targeting and stuff like that. So it was a fairly small domain. But here we have 50 different business units, where which each are each their own domain. And it's not really big data as much as it's very diverse data. But we, de we do need to share across. So what we're trying to do is build this kind of uh, service platform, which this data platform is part of to make it easier for developers, both in the city government and outside, to, to provide new services. As I mentioned, it's not big data per se. So our assumption as we started building this is that serverless would be a good fit. Because we have to provide uh, very many services, but it's not very high volume. So we're doing things like we're uh, handling a, a lot of documents, essentially, like Excel, Word, and so on. Uh, different systems that we need to integrate with uh, sensor data come in 
And of course, there is like the regular data inter integrations with databases and external data sources. We want to provide as much as, uh, as possible out, again, as open data for other partners or other people to use. Uh, share with the businesses and, and commercial partners, but also across the public sector. Um, and of course, enable uh, the users in the city to, to do things like analytic, analytics and, and insights. So I mentioned there's a, a broad specter uh, here. So one of the things I read recently was this article from ThoughtWorks, which I thought was interesting uh, to share, which talks about this data mesh idea, where you have distributed data domains. Like I said, we have very many different domains, and we need to have an infrastructure below that, so that the different data owners can sort of create their own uh, data pipelines and such. Um, so what, that's kind of what we're trying to build. A lot of tooling and, and tools to, to enable them to build their own data pipelines self-serve, so we shouldn't be sort of the man in the middle uh, bottleneck for them. <coughs> um, as I said, serverless seems to be a good fit here because we will have a lot of small pipelines, a lot of small data sets and so on. So what are we using serverless for in our data platform currently? We're using it to build uh, a set of microservices, essentially REST APIs, to do things like the metadata APIs and things like that. But we're also building processing pipelines, so components for doing data transformations, data vi uh, validations, and, and connecting these together. Um, and the, the goal right now, we need to code this thing essentially ourselves. But the, the goal is for the different uh, developers and users to be able to, to, to define this uh, on their own. We're using uh, a lot of different services in Amazon. Uh, these are but a few, like Kinesis for stream processing, for example, API Gateway for REST APIs, uh, step functions for orchestrations, and so on. And we'll touch on some of these today, but not all of them. And we use a whole lot more as well. So. Um, by the way, if, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention at the beginning, but if you have any questions, feel free to stop me and, along the way and, and ask. So we'll touch on these a little bit, but the goal here is, of course, to talk about serverless framework and AWS Lambda. So anyone here already using Amazon Lambda? A couple of people, yeah? So a lot of this should be fairly familiar for you, for you right? Uh, I won't be able to go into much depth on these topics, essentially, since I'm trying to cover a fairly broad uh, topic. But So the, the actual Lambda functions themselves will be very, very simple. I'm just trying to f show you how we can use serverless framework to help with some of the issues that you have when you usually develop uh, these functions. So Lambda is a compute service in Amazon Cloud that lets you deploy and run simple functions. So what does that mean? Um, you, can, you can set up, sorry, you can set up, um, you can upload functions and have them run based on various events or triggers, uh, as opposed to uploading a container or a Docker image uh, of, sort of some, or some sort. So it's just sing, single functions, essentially. And you can have a lot of them, of course. Uh, it's serverless, so there are no servers to manage. It, Amazon takes care of all the scaling for you and, and that kind of stuff, so you don't have to worry about that. And, and you essentially, you pay as you go. You pay for the amount of compute that you use, uh, plus the memory. So this, these are kind of the two things you need to think about. So the runtime is charged per one-tenth of a second, I believe. Um, and also the amount of memory that you reserve for your function comes into play. And um, yeah, and it supports a ton of different languages. So you, we, I'm not sure if this is complete, but this is the one I, I saw, or the ones I saw recently, at least. Um, we're using Python for a bunch of stuff we we're doing, but also uh, not Java, but Kotlin. So anything that runs on the JVM, essentially, you can use as well. If you want to use Java or Scala or Kotlin, go at it. And you can also, if you want to do something else, you can bring your own runtime, essentially. <coughs> All right. So 
all good all demos should start with hello world, right? So this is the simplest function I could create essentially. It's uh, Python just takes in so a, a lambda function will take in an event, your input event, and a context, which is essentially the lambda runtime context, where you can do things like uh, query for uh, how much memory you have available or how long runtime you have left until your uh, function is terminated, because you can I think it's 15 minutes is the limit you can run a function for. And you can do things like logging and so on. So what you do when you deploy this is essentially you just set up you deploy this code, and you, set a, you tell Lambda what your function endpoint is, with the name of the, the class or whatever, and the function um, that it should call. So we can do a quick demo. If I can try This works. No. I need to go out here. And I need to, s let's see, mirror. All right, if we go here to Lambda, I already have deployed a couple of Lambda functions. Let's see if we can zoom in a bit. Um, that are running. Um, but let's create just a simple function from scratch. We can just call it hello. And I don't know Node, so we'll do it in Python. Um, It will set up a new function for you and give you essentially an editor where you can uh, see the function code and start running, uh, writing things. And here, we see the, the Lambda dashboard. So we have our, our function here. Uh, it also has con some, you can have some connections. For instance, here it's automatically set up connection for the CloudWatch logging infrastructure. You can have various triggers on the, on the other side here. You can see this list here is kind of things that can trigger your function. Right now, we just want to create the function itself. So we requested Python, so it's already set up a very simple handler function for us, which just returns a, a JSON object, essentially, with the status code and a, a body. So this would work well for a REST kind of function. And if you see here, our handler is specified as, essentially, in Python, it's the file name and the function name. So we could, uh, if we want to just uh, call this uh, hello, for instance, we'd also need to update what to call here. If we want to test this, uh, we can do so. We need to create a test event. Right now, we don't have any input data that we want. So we can just uh, have an empty, empty JSON object as a test event. All right, let's test it. Uh, if we scroll up, we should see that the execution succeeded. And it returned this object that we saw. Right? So you can get started easily with like playing around with the different uh, runtimes and such with this. And you can, you can go in, you can edit the code from this console and, and start testing and playing around with it and tweaking the different uh, options here. So. But of course, this, th that's ni nice for prototyping and stuff, but it's not the way you want to do it in, in your production system, because uh, um, you want to have a bit more control. So let's see if we can. Uh, it's not running. Separate display. All right. So what's the problem? Well, this guy is not too amused. Uh, of course, you don't want to have manual configuration and deployment of, of your functions and stuff. You want to have essentially your infrastructure as code, or at least as configuration, which is typically the case. Not, not usually code, but more like YAML or JSON. So if, you, if you're familiar with Amazon, uh, the, the, the tool that you typically use is called uh, CloudFormation. Um, and it supports setting up your Lambda functions, but it's very much, it's a, it's a lot of boilerplate. You have to essentially set up all the different endpoints and connections and, and so on man, uh, manually. So it, you have to repeat a lot of stuff for each function that you create. 
a lot of people also use Terraform for setting up their infrastructure and services in, in, uh, in the cloud. So, so Terraform is similar to CloudFormation, but it supports um, several, cloud, several clouds, essentially. Now, Amazon realized that using CloudFormation for this was very tedious. So they created something else they called Serverless Application Model, or SAM. I'm not sure why they have a squirrel but, uh, as a logo, but um, there you have it. But there are also other options. So the one that we're going to look at today is the serverless framework, which is kind of similar in a, that it focuses on setting up lambdas and, and functions, but it also supports uh, multiple clouds. And another option that we looked at when we were serving the different tools was something called Pulumi, which is actually infrastructure as code, where you, instead of configuring as YAML or JSON, um, you actually code your infrastructure using uh, JavaScript or Python or Go, or I think it supports other languages as well. So that has some nice features that you can actually do, like unit testing, for example, of your infrastructure code and things like that. Um, but we saw, at least when we were looking at it, it didn't seem to have support for all the features in the cloud that we wanted to use. But it is moving ahead quite rapidly. But the talk of the topic of this talk is the serverless framework. So what does that do? Uh, it's a free tool that you can uh, download. They also have this sort of enterprise version where you get a bunch of other support for having things in the cloud as a software as a service, but we're only using the, the free framework, essentially. So what does it do? It helps you configure and deploy your service applications, and, and does this much simpler than if you have to use the built-in uh, uh, cloud formation, for example. It supports multiple cloud operators, so Google, Amazon, Microsoft. You can also run things on Kubernetes or uh, OpenWhisk, which is, um, I think it's an Apache project to, to run serverless functions. OK, so let's look at uh, a simple example, so similar to this uh, basic hello world function. So if you want to follow along in this Git repository, it's in uh, the directory called one underscore hello. Um, so one way to get started with serverless framework is you can use uh, templates. So they provide a bunch of templates for creating, essentially, the setup for, for your function. So you can, for example, you can create uh, a template for uh, Amazon function written in Python 3, or Java, or Kotlin, and so on. And this will generate the, the basic configuration files and, and a bare bones function implementation for you. But let's start from scratch, because it's kind of simple, the kind of things we want to do now. So a very basic configuration file for serverless, they use a YAML configuration files, essentially, to, to tell, you, tell serverless what it's supposed to do. So here, we have defined that we want a service named hello. Uh, we need to tell it which cloud provider we should run it. So in this case, Amazon in the EU West 1 region, and our runtime is Python 3.7. And finally, we need to tell it what functions to create. So we have one function here called hello with a handler, uh, which is the Python code that we want to run when this function is triggered. And that code is the same that we saw previously, so it's just this handler Python file with a hello method that will be called. So let's see how this works if we deploy it. So in, in that uh, Git repository, if you, if you check out the code there, there are some instructions on how to set up, um, how to set up everything if you want to play with this yourself uh, in terms of installing serverless infra um, the serverless framework and so on. Uh, essentially, you get a command called serverless, uh, or SLS for short. Um, so we can see that we have this serverless YAML file here, the same that we saw. So let me try to deploy this. What it will do here is, uh, first it will it's actually under the covers. It's using CloudFormation for setting things up, for configuring uh, the resources in, in Amazon. So what it's doing it to begin with here is to set up uh, an, uh, an S3 bucket for you to deploy your code in. 
This takes a little while the first time, but once you, once you have your function set up, deploying new versions is, is much faster. Um, of course, I also suggest that if you want to do this uh, at a larger scale, you probably want to set up a, a dedicated deploy bucket and configure it to use that instead of creating a, a separate bucket for each function. Um, OK, so it's created our S3 bucket, and now it's packaged and uploaded all the code, two lines of it, up to S3. And it's creating another CloudFormation stack for the Lambda infrastructure. So once this is done, we can check out our Lambda console to see that we have a function here. So I have a bunch of them deployed, but this is the one that we, if we look at the last modified time, this is the one that we just deployed. Um, as you can see, it's very similar to one we looked at previously. This is the code uh, that I told it to deploy. Now we can we can test it like we did previously in the the console on uh, the web console, or we can use serverless itself to to run the code and test it, which is quite nice. So you can invoke a function. Just give it a function name, hello. And it will call the function on AWS for you, and it will show you the result. Um, so that's an easier way to test your functions. Right now, this function, of course, is very simple. It doesn't take any input and so on, but we'll get to that. Now, if I want to, if I want to remove this uh, again, I can just say uh, SLS remove, and I will take remove the function and uh, destroy the S3 bucket and so on. I won't do that right now. All right, so let's go back to the presentation. All right, so uh, there are some screenshots basically showing what I just did. Um, what I didn't talk about was this, this output uh, that I got when the deploy finished, which shows you a bunch of information about your deployed function. Right now, there's not a whole lot here. It just shows me the service name. It also has this concept of stage, so you can have multiple stages in the same account if you want to have like a development version, testing version, production version, and so on. Um, we've deployed our dev and production code in, in separate AWS accounts, so for us that doesn't really uh, do help us that much. But if you want to have multiple development versions, for example, you can have that in the same account with different stage names. Um, yeah, so essentially the, this function name is a composite of this service name, the stage name, and the function name itself. Uh, we saw the invoke, and yeah, if I did the remove, it would just remove all the Lambda infrastructure and also remove the, the S3 bucket in this case, since we set up a bucket specifically for this function. So what are some use cases for, for Lambda? I think I talked a little bit about it, but you can do a, b a lot of different things. Like you can build backend APIs, REST APIs, for instance, using this. You can also host, essentially, simple web applications using Lambda. Um, you can use it for event processing or file processing. Um, things like ETL, transferring data from between different sources. Uh, the things that we are currently using it for are, are these, the backend and event of file processing. So essentially our, our data pipelines and, and our uh, various uh, REST services. And I'm sure there are uh, plenty more use cases, but uh, as you can see when we look at how you can trigger these. So you can trigger uh, Lambda um, in many different ways. Uh, you can use uh, it, you can trigger it through HTTP calls, through either this API gateway, which we'll see later, or also their application told balancer. Um, you can trigger it from various kind of messaging or notification services. So SNS is this notification service in, in AWS, and you have SQS as a messaging queue. Kinesis uh, is a stream, uh, event stream as a service. And S3 is their object store code. So, so for instance, we trigger our, uh, some pipelines when new files are uploaded to S3. That will trigger the processing pipelines. 
Uh, you can also trigger uh, lambdas when there are changes in your DynamoDB database, for instance, or when uh, you can also listen to WebSockets to have more long-lived sort of conversations between your your web client and and uh, and Lambda. If you have sensors, you can use the IoT infrastructure in, uh, in Amazon. We essentially just use a REST API for that currently. And you can trigger it through other things as well. Alexa for like speech interfaces. Uh, CloudWatch, if you have alarms on your infrastructure, for example, you can trigger various Lambda functions through that. Or just simple scheduled uh, calls, like every hour or 10 minutes or so. The ones that we'll look at today are the API gateway integration uh, for REST services or, or um, HTTP services and uh, message handling through SNS, event handling through SNS. Part of the reason for that, I wanted to do Kinesis, for instance, but that's not available in the free uh, account, so yeah. All right. Any questions so far or no? <coughs> All right, so let's look at how we can extend our simple hello function with a REST API. Um, to do this, we will put the API gateway in front of, uh, of Lambda. Um, there's a bunch of documentation on how you can configure that here on the serverless uh, framework web page. The slides are available, as I said, on this, uh, on this link here. Um, so essentially what we need to do is extend our serverless configuration with this simple uh, we need to define what events will trigger our, our function instead of just triggering it manually. So in this case, we set up an HTTP event with a path and a method. Fairly simple stuff. We can have, of course, uh, of course, path parameters here, like a name. We can also have uh, support for query parameters and various uh, headers and such. Our code will have to look a bit different because now, instead of getting just the payload, for instance, as an input, we will get a, an event which contains a lot of information about the HTTP request. So for instance, our event will now contain um, a dictionary or a nested set of dictionaries. So one of them is path parameters. And here we can extract the name parameter from the URL. And we can build up our response, for example, as a JSON object with our, with our greeting and return this. So in this case, we need to return, we need to build up the HTTP response, essentially, um, which is our status result code and the, and the body of the, of the response. So this, this JSON dumps will, will take care of basically writing uh, this into a string or converting it to a string. Yeah, there's a ton of details on how to configure uh, this stuff, but um, yeah, there's a link here for more more details. You can't probably read it right now, but if you have a look at the PDFs, it should be okay. All right, so let's have a look at the deploy here. It's very similar to what we saw in the previous one, but there is some more detail now. So, for instance, if we look at the output for this, uh, the result when the deploy is done, we'll have an endpoint now. So we have a, defined a get endpoint here which we can call. So let's try that. Um, switch back to mirror. All right. Just need to move to the correct. And I redeployed, so I have a different URL than it's in my slides. But OK, so here's the endpoint that I want. I don't want to have the curly brace name thing. So let's say we want to greet Berlin. All right. So this will, by the way, if you are doing any sort of REST or HTTP stuff from the command line, I suggest installing HTTP PI if you haven't already. Uh, it's very much nicer to work with than, than curl. Um, all right, so here we see a bunch of response uh, details and also the message body that we output, right? We can, of course, also call this with the invoke function that we saw earlier. 
with the function name hello. If we try to do this now without anything else, of course, it will fail because we didn't provide the parameter. So essentially, we will get uh, a Python error message back because we didn't have very good error handling in our code, right? So we didn't. Typically, we would say this should be a 400 error or something if we don't provide the path parameters. But we can do that also here on the command line. I just need to pass it a, a data, uh, pass the data. And now in this case, since we're not we're calling the function directly and not through the API gateway, we have to uh, emulate the event format that the API gateway sends us. So we can do this through saying uh, pass parameters um, name. Berlin. That should work, hopefully. Yeah, there we go. So now we also see the entire uh, response that it sends back to API Gateway. So API Gateway will take this response and convert it to an HTTP response with the correct status code and, and body. And you can also add things like headers here if you want to, for example, do uh, course or something like that. Oh, let me see. All right. Um, yeah, we saw this stuff. Um, yeah. All right. One thing we haven't talked about is documentation. So you of course, if you create a REST API, you want good documentation of it out of the box, right? Um, that's one of the things you don't get here since with this default Lambda integration, you get um, pretty much all of the HTTP handling is inside your code and not dealt with by the API gateway. It just essentially just wraps the entire HTTP request and sends it to your, to your code. So if I look at the if I look at the web console for API Gateway, I can have it generate things like Swagger or Open API specs from my from my endpoints. But here there's very little information. It just has the the path essentially in the method, and it doesn't tell me anything about uh, response format, for example. Fortunately, there is a plugin for Serverless Framework that allows you to. to to extend this, so it's called Serverless AWS Documentation, uh, which allows you to document uh, a bunch of the like endpoints, input and output formats, and so on. Um, and this will then allow you to generate this Swagger or Open API spec from the API gateway. What you need to do is essentially, okay, if you follow it from the GitHub repo, um, you need to extend your Serverless YAML with this documentation, essentially. Um, descriptions, the path parameters in this case with uh, names, description, and your method response types. So in here we have an example of, okay, so if we respond with application JSON, this is our response model, and we can define our response models as essentially uh, JSON schemas. And you can also, if when you have multiple of these in, in your file, you typically also want to utilize this include mechanism so you don't have a huge serverless YAML file with all of this stuff. But these models can also be, of course, reused across uh, different endpoints, for example, or functions if they have the similar input or output format. So in order to apply this, uh, this plugin, you just add this section here to your uh, serverless YAML file. And now when you deploy, you will get a Swagger spec that contains more uh, information and you can generate clients based on that and so on. All right. I realize I'm running very fast through my slides, but um, Please stop me if you have any questions. Or I think we can also, like I said, a lot of these uh, examples are, are fairly simple. But if we have time at the end, we can go back and maybe ex try to extend some of them with some improved error handling or look at other ways to connect things. So let's look at event processing. 
In our case, we want to use uh, the, the notification service, SNS, as a trigger. So similar to our HTTP endpoint, we can set up uh, an event type now with the type SNS. And by default, if you just give it a, a topic name, it will actually also create this topic for you and give you all the necessary permissions to read from it and so on. So I'm not, you, you can also, of course, reuse topics that you have already set up, but then you need to provide um, uh, policies and, and roles and stuff to be able to access that. So I'm not going to go into detail on that stuff today. But, um, but you can, of course, reuse infrastructure that you've already set up in, in, your, um, in your account. Now, uh, our handler will look a bit different because, of course, this event format now will look different than the one that we had for HTTP requests. So it will look more like, uh, like this. All these different event formats are, are documented, of course, on the Amazon documentation pages. Uh, but in this case, we get not a single event at a time, but a batch of events from SNS. So you might get one, or you might get multiple. Um, so we can do a for loop here over the uh, records in, in our input event and extract, for example, this, uh, the, the actual body of the message. In this case, I haven't connected it, this function to anything, it, except it's, it's only writing, essentially logging what it gets. We can, you can, uh, what we do in our case is typically write, uh, so for instance, we have a, a bunch of sensor data coming in, and we write the latest observed value into DynamoDB, so we can build an, a simple API on top of that, to just query for the last observed uh, value. So in order to publish an event here, uh, you, you can either go on the console, the SNS, to the, uh, SNS console, and publish the event from there, or you can use the command line uh, tool for, for Amazon Web Services, and do SNS publish to your uh, region and topic with a message. So in this case, hello buzzwords, um, you get some feedback on the message ID, and if I look at the at the logs, I will see, for the Lambda function, I will see that, oh, we got this event. So it triggered successfully. We can try this as well if we, let's see. Where is my pointer? There. And I need to give you the display. There's another um, service uh, command here, SLS info. Is a, it gives us this, this information that we had um, that you saw at the end of the deploy. So if you want to get information about the endpoints and so on, you can just run SLS info, and it will tell you details about your deployed function. Um, all right, but here, uh, let's see. I need to go into the actual console to see what it's called. So simple notification service, um, see if we have any topics here. Yeah, my events. So I need to use this uh, ARN, which is basically the URL or identifier for, for my, uh, my topic. Um, Um, hello, Berlin buzzword. Nope, what did I do wrong? Publish, of course. Oh, what did I do? Oh, sorry. Copied the wrong thing. Why didn't it work? There we go. Um, it's a bit slow, the network. OK, so that published a uh, message there. And if I go back to my logging CloudWatch logging console, uh, find the right log group. Uh, which one was it? Event processing. 
this is the one. No, that's an old. No, this is the one I think. Yeah, it's UTC. Always get tripped up by the UTC here. So here we can see the event that was published or the the log that we did. But typically, of course, you will have this function do something more interesting than just log it. Um, All right. And one of the things that we are using it for is to connect uh, multiple functions together to, to create a pipeline. And so how do you orchestrate this stuff? How do you get them to work, play well together, essentially? Um, so you have two, uh, two basic options, I think. One is that you can use the Lambda functions fairly standalone and then connect them through like message queues or, or SNS topics and so forth, or via Kinesis stream, for example, and just use your regular um, Amazon APIs to, to publish events from your Lambdas, because you, you can do whatever you want from your Lambdas, essentially, and then that can trigger other, um, other functions. That gives you a nice decoupling which can be good in some cases, but sometimes you have something that works better as a whole, and then you might want to have a tool for, for orchestrating that better. So what we use for that is Amazon uh, Step Functions. So this essentially allows you to build um, a state machine or a, a flow, not a state machine, it's more like a flow graph for your data and, and execution. Um, so you can have various tasks uh, that trigger in a sequence, uh, and you can have decision points where you can, based on uh, the event data, you can trigger one or other paths in, uh, in your graph. Uh, for instance, to check if you, if you validate some data, you can do different actions based on whether the data is valid or not. So in, your, in our case, um, we're defining, th this requires also another plugin, by the way serverless step functions. So there's a whole ecosystem of these kind of plugins for different, different tools and different services. So what we do here, we have, here we have two functions now. One, uh, this is to uh, get sensor data with temperatures. It's very simplified compared to the one that we have in our system, but so what we essentially try to do here is we want to validate that this temperature data is, is valid according to our, our schema, for instance, or that the, the values that we get in make sense, because we have some sensors now that uh, are fairly cheap, so they fail sometimes, or they run out of power, and then they suddenly reply, uh, report that the temperature in the Oslo Fjord is minus 273 degrees, which is obviously false, but uh, zero Kelvin. Um, so those kind of things we want to try to filter out, right? We also want this, these sensors don't know much about uh, other things like where they are located or descriptions and so on. So we want to enrich the data with more information. So we can do that. So we have one function to validate the data that we get in and one to enrich it with some more information. So we set up a, st a state machine here. So uh, which we call process temperatures. So it's triggered by an HTTP endpoint, essentially. So we can set up very similar to the HTTP trigger we use with API Gateway. This will trigger the step function if we post an event to this, uh, to this uh, path. And then we have the definition of our actual uh, function orchestration. So here we have a, a state machine called uh, Sorry, I'm missing something. Anyway, oh, that was on the previous one. Um, so we have a set of tasks here, and we start at this task, valid temperature. It connects to this one function that we created. And here you can see this, this naming here is what, this is the actual cloud formation name that this function gets. So you have to know kind of that it will take this name here, give, capitalize it, and add lambda function. Right. And then we say, okay, if this thing succeeds, the next task is in rich location, and sort of, you can build up a graph here, essentially. Or, uh, yeah. Now, our handler, uh, in this case, has two functions in it. 
one validate temperature and one enrich location. So this validate temperature will just look at the temperature values and see if they make sense. And if, if not, it will throw an exception. And it returns the event, and that result from this will essentially then be passed on as the input to the next function in, in uh, func next task uh, in our state in our flow graph. And here we'll just, uh, okay, we won't look at, we could add, for example, in our case, we have a, a lookup table which gives us, or we can look up the sensor ID and enrich it with more information with, for example, geographical location and description and so on, uh, and then return that. So if we do this, we will get uh, a new endpoint, essentially. Let's see if we can have a look at this. Keep losing my pointer. Here we go. So we go into the orchestration here. Uh, have a look at the info. Uh, did it not deploy my endpoints? Interesting. I just needed to have a check here. Um, Hmm. All right, okay. This is why I have photos or pictures in my slides. <laughs> the demo effect hits. All right, let's go back here. So, not sure why that didn't work, but anyway. Uh, so, typically, you will get this endpoint where you can post now, as opposed to get. Um, and what this thing, if you use this HTTP Pi tool, uh, you can create a JSON object using this. So this will essentially create a JSON object with a temperature field with a value 28 and as your body. Uh, so this, the response here uh, from our HTTP endpoint is that it started executing our state machine. And you will get something like this. So. We get a nice little graph showing us how the functions are connected together. Yes, question? Right. Because the question is, can you do asynchronous stuff in these, or do you have to return uh, the value? So you can do asynchronous uh, lambdas in general. Um, although in this case, I think it makes more sense since you want the output here to go here. If, if you're coding, like for instance, in a, in a language like uh, JavaScript or using Node, that is more of a asynchronous uh, approach, then you, in, in your um, event handler, or, or your, your method will take a third argument, which is a callback function. So you can, when, once your code is done, you will call that callback with your, with your result. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, so in this case, um, we're looking at the output from the R enriched location. So we see that, okay, it got an input. So it passed through the validation step. It got the input just passed along. And then the output from the function got added uh, location data. Now, if we had called this with a, a temperature that was outside our defined range, uh, we would see something like this. So in this case, our validate temperature function failed with an exception, uh, saying it's too cold, since I passed it in the temperature minus 29. Now, this is a very simple example, uh, of course. But in, in our system right now, we have pipelines that look more like this, for example. So this is a simple pipeline to take in like Excel files, convert them to CSV, do some validation and transformations on this, and, and uh, yeah which the users of our pipeline can define what these transformations are and so on. So you can build fairly complex, complex stuff. And also, um, right now, I only showed an example where, uh, in, in the previous one, where sort of the output of this goes directly as input to this. But you can configure a bunch of more stuff, like how essentially there's essentially a JSON object that flows through here, which you can, you can modify along the way. And, uh, and tell it which parts to pass to this to different uh, functions. So we have one question here. 
Yes, that's for each lambda function. I'm not sure if there's a similar time limit for step functions. I don't think so. So like the aggregate can be longer, I think. Yeah. Question in the back. This one, yeah. All right. Okay. So why not? So why are these different functions? Do we not have a, a lot of overhead instead of putting everything into one uh, one uh, function? So first of all, these are written in different languages. So some of the code here is Python, uh, but, but this one, for example, is, is Kotlin. So we're using f here, for example, to convert our Excel file to CSV. We're using a Python library for that. But here we're using a, a Java library for doing a CSV uh, transformation. So that allows us to build kind of things like that, because otherwise we would have to reinvent one or the other, essentially. Um, but yeah, of course, I mean, the granularity here is something that you need to decide. And also in terms of, I think the idea is here, if you, if you create these kind of pipelines, how do you do error handling? Where does it retry? Where do you sort of, try to recover if, uh, if something fails and so on. So right now, each of these steps will output, or at least the first two or three will output files to S3, which the next step will read in. So we, can, we have more sort of uh, history and, and audit log, essentially, of what was going on. Does that make sense? Yeah. Good question. Um, but yeah, for sure, if, if this had been all one all one uh, language, it might make sense to combine some of these steps. But these functions, of course, are also useful in other pipelines. So we can combine these in different ways, right? Hmm. Yes, question. So, sorry, I didn't catch that pass. Oh, yes. Yeah. So the question is, uh, what if uh, we saw in previously that we have uh, batching for uh, input events for, from SNS, for instance. Um, so this one, the, the trigger for uh, the step function here is, uh, well, in our example, it was HTTP. Uh, in our case, it's actually another Lambda function invoking it, but uh, so we don't have a batch of event coming in here. I'm not sure how that would work, really, because uh, how would you do, like, if one of them fails, I don't think you can have, like, one event here fan out to, like, 500 on the next step, um, if that's what you were asking about. I think in, in, in our case, the, 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 the whole state machine or the whole flow will either fail or, or succeed. Yeah, does that answer? Yeah. yeah. But I think in our, in our case, all we always have one input event in this case. Yeah. And, and there are, so you, you can use several different type of triggers for step functions as well, but I'm not sure. It doesn't have as many. Like you have HTTP endpoints, you have scheduled timers, and maybe one or two more, but I don't think you can use SNS, for example, as a trigger. So you'd have to from your SNS topic, you could have a lambda that would then trigger your step functions, right? Which would then call it once for each event. Does that make sense? Any more questions? Yes, one here. So can the output or result from this fan out to multiple consumers again, for instance? Uh, it depends on what you do here. Like, for instance, here uh, we write output to S3. This will trigger another pipeline, essentially, which does further processing of this CSV file. It will trigger, essentially, a number of pipelines. So you, you could, but, but it's not connected to, it's not this one triggering, it's directly. 
Yeah, or, or we could, of course, write to SNS or Kinesis or something here, right? But if in order to trigger another orchestration like this, you would have to have a Lambda function in, in between your Kinesis stream, for instance, and, and step functions. Does that answer it? Yeah. So, yeah, event at a time, at least for the stuff that we do. Um, now, as we produce, actually, in each step here, we produce intermediate files in S3. And that will trigger notifications, which will then trigger potentially other runs of this. Yes? So you said that so when you do the enrichment, you query to the image, for example, if that's the three and one at a time, it will pick up that stuff? Uh, you can do that, yeah. We're not doing it in this case, but you you can call uh, you can do from your lambda. You can do whatever you want essentially, right? As long as, long as you keep within that time limit. So if um, you can call out to to uh, DynamoDB, for example, to query to join with data there, or in our case, we have some internal lookup tables uh, that are basically just configuration. Yeah, but you you can call external services from your lambda functions, no problem. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That could be an issue, and we'll get into that um, briefly. Actually, on the next slide. <laughs> um, all right. Any more questions before we move on? All right. Let's talk about performance then. Um, how many have heard of this uh, cold start problem? Are you familiar with that? Yeah. So. Okay. So essentially, the way Lambda works. Uh, I stole the next picture from a different from an article here. The way it does is when you trigger a lambda, it will first fetch the code from S3. It will start up a container to run with your runtime. Um, and, and then once that is bootstrapped, it's run, ready to actually run your code. So this part here is what's called a cold start. And it adds latency to your code, right? But what it does is it will reuse this container, if it can, within some uh, time span defined by Amazon, which they don't tell you. But you know. um, So you want to try to avoid this, or at least keep this as low as possible. But what they say is that you should really just worry about this part mainly, because it's Amazon's challenge to sort of reduce this as much as possible, right? That's their deal. That's what they can do. Um, but there are things you need to take into consideration here. Uh, so the, the life cycle is essentially that, so one container is uh, one execution. There's no parallelism inside one container. So you run your handler. When it's done, it can run another uh, or handle another event, but it won't do multiple inside a single container in parallel. So what happens if you have multiple requests or triggers coming in, it will spin up more containers on demand, right? And then once they are idle, it will spin them back down again. But there's this time in between when the handler is done. What it does is essentially it will freeze the container and the current state in the container. And if it, another request comes in uh, within some given time frame, it will thaw that container and will uh, enable that to to run that request or handle that request and then, and then freeze it again. But after some time, the, the container will be destroyed and removed. So what you want is to have essentially this happen, right? Instead of booting up new containers all the time. Um, what we see in terms of cold start in our code in, in Python and, and Kotlin or Java, JVM, it, it varies, but it can be, f and the cold start could be anywhere from like a couple hundred milliseconds to maybe a second or two, typically. Whereas if you have a, a, a container that's ready, it's your res our response time is down in a few milliseconds for the simple services. One thing that can can uh, make this quite a bit worse if you is if you're using a virtual private clouds or VPCs, if, you're, if you want to, for example, uh, query a database that's in a separate private subnet in your, in your VPC configuration. So you, you've sort of split your, your account into multiple virtual clouds to, for, for security purposes and so on. That's fairly common. 
Um, every time a Lambda container needs to connect to that, uh, to that VPC, it will need to set up a, a network interface, essentially, a network connection. And that can take a long time, up to like 10 seconds or so. So that's uh, one of the reasons why we, for example, decided to put all of our metadata and stuff for our pipelines in, in DynamoDB instead of in RDS, the, their SQL as a service. Because um, that's not, there you don't put, you don't put DynamoDB in a VPC because you handle all the security stuff through their regular identity and access management controls. Whereas if you run like a SQL database, uh, it will need to deal with its own security, right? It's not connected to the IAM infrastructure. So just to be aware that you can have long uh, cold, uh, cold starts, especially if you do things like connect to, to other uh, subnets in, in your, um, or other VPCs in your network. Um, they are working on improving this. So instead of every container having to set up their own network interface, uh, it's going to be one between the VPCs or something like that. So they're, they announced something this winter, I think, that they're working on. Sometime this year, it should be fixed. I'm not sure when. Yes. Yes. Right. Good point. Uh, so resources uh, that are costly, those would typically, uh, in your code, would typically be set up here, right? So you want to avoid that you do this in your, in your handler code. If you set up a network connection, or a database connection, for example, or some other kind of resource that takes time to, to set up, you want to have that um, be kept through this uh, freeze and thaw, and thaw cycle. And you can do that. If you just put it in like a global variable or a, a singleton or something that survives, uh, that, that's sort of outside your handler function, that's just part of the regular class uh, setup, for example, then that will survive. And you can reuse that. And I've heard people do interesting things like put their Kafka clients in there and so on, uh, which sounded very, <laughs> yeah. And then they had to do things like check whether the client was still alive and restart it and so on. So yeah, you can do crazy stuff. Right. Um, I'm nearing the end. Um, a couple more things. So packaging your code. We haven't looked at that in detail, right? But for now, we've just written very, very simple functions that don't have any dependencies or anything. But essentially, it will, so serverless framework will deploy a zip file. Um, but you, of course, you have to tell it what should be in that zip file. So for, for uh, and you want to try to bundle all your dependencies in there. So if you're writing Java code, for example, you can have uh, Gradle or Maven create like a, these kind of fat jars that you can point to and have that be your deployment artifact. You can also deploy, and I actually think that's recommended, is to have your dependencies as separate jars in a library directory and have it put that into the zip file. For some reason, that's supposed to be faster in the cold start or something. Uh, less code to scan, I think, when they do the, the, hot, the, the hot path. You can also do something called layers. So if you have a lot of, a lot of uh, kind of libraries or dependencies that you reuse across many functions, you can create a layer that you can then build your function on top of. So if you're using things like uh, NumPy or something like Pandas to do numerical analysis, for example, in Python, you can create a layer that contains those, those libraries, which can be fairly large. Like you can have, I'm not sure about the size limits of the layers, but uh, these are easily like 40, 50 megabytes that you don't want to upload every time you upload your function. So that's a good idea to create a layer and then reuse it. It's kind of similar to how you do Docker images, like you build on layers on top of each other. I think you can have up to five layers on top of each other in, in Lambda. Another thing to think about is uh, the runtime environment is Linux. So if you're building your Python code uh, and libraries dependencies on, on Mac, for example, it will not include the correct libraries or the, like the native libraries. So the, 
The thing you do there is the, for, for Python, there's a, another plugin that's called serverless Python requirements that will, if you're not running on Linux, it will boot up a Docker image to do the packaging, essentially. So you get the, the Linux dependencies in there. All right, uh, testing. So we've seen a little bit of it. Uh, so for instance, uh, if, you, if you just like write everything into your handler function, uh, a lot of concerns that are not part of your business logic will creep into your methods. Uh, things like handling HTTP requests and responses, uh, dealing with the SNS event formats and such. So like any sort of, it's just good practice. Separate your business logic into separate methods and so on. So you can test them, unit test them, and mock out, for example, uh, if, if you call, like for instance, if you call other S, uh, AWS services like DynamoDB or S3, it's a good idea to, to have those passed in as dependencies that you can then mock out or use things like in Python. You have this, the Python AWS libraries uh, are called Boto or Boto. Three and they have this Moto library, which is a mocked version of that. So you can have, you can mock out and do tests for the different uh, AWS services, which which is very useful. So if you want to uh, mock out S3, for example, you can easily do that and then do uh, set up your mocks and tests that things were put in the right place and so on. Um, another thing you can do is also to invoke the functions locally instead of calling out into the cloud. So. Invoke local will run the function on, on your local machine instead. Of course, this can run into issues if you want to actually use other cloud infrastructure, which is the big kind of hurdle here, right? If you want to use other services, you either have to actually call into the cloud or mock them out somehow, or you can also try to use things like, there are some tools that allow you to run things locally, like Kinesa Lite, or, or uh, you can actually download a local version of DynamoDB and run it on your machine. For, typically, you do this through Docker images. So there's also a bunch of tips and, and tricks for testing uh, on the serverless framework uh, web page. Um, OK, so there's a bunch of stuff I haven't talked about. We have some time, so we can go into stuff if we want. Uh, Setting up other infrastructure, like outside the, the stuff, uh, like if you have sh stuff that's shared between these functions or, or pipelines, typically you want to set them up outside of serverless framework. So we use Terraform for that in our case. So we just have to reference the, the IDs essentially in our, in our serverless framework uh, configurations. Um, access control, I mentioned briefly, but typically you also then need uh, not only to reference the, these infrastructure elements, but also give them access. You need to set up the Lambda roles and so on. So in, in our case, we haven't set up anything like that. So all of the stuff, since we package everything, we let serverless framework create our SNS topic, for example, it, it automatically set up the roles and, and policies to allow our Lambda function to actually connect to that topic. But if we had been reusing an existing topic, we would need to provide the policies and stuff to do that. Um, in terms of the API gateway integrations we looked at, there's a bunch of discussions on whether to use this, what's called the Lambda proxy, which is what we saw, which essentially passes the entire HTTP request into your, into your method and lets you deal with all the details there. Or whether you should use something called a, a Lambda integration instead of Lambda proxy. So that lets the API gateway do its work ex actually, like taking care of the HTTP part of it and just passing you um, a more domain specific or business specific event, the, doing the transformations, doing the status handling and so on. So there, this is a link, but uh, not sure if it's clickable in the PDF. I'll have a, I'll have a check. If not, I'll put it on the, on the GitHub repo. Um, so there's a, uh, this one links to like five, four or five different articles with discussions on pros and cons there. And related to that, also validation of your input. Like in our code now, we would do the validation in our handler, but in, in the API gateway, for example, you could do validation of your response or requests and responses, or requests, I guess, uh, by, by providing, for example, adjacent schemas. And also, 
things like the Lambda proxy, as far as I know, doesn't handle uh, or check that you, for example, call with the correct uh, method or, um, sorry, with the connect correct content type and so on. So you need to deal with a bunch of that stuff in your code. Whereas if you use the more the Lambda integration, it's more set up on the API gateway side, but you get more out of it as well. Um, and versioning of your functions. So typically you will have, if you have a continuous deployment pipeline, for example, you will have different versions of your functions. So SLS, sorry, uh, serverless framework, when it deploys, it actually creates new versions of your, of your function. So if we go in and look at it, every time I deploy now, I will get a new version. And it just automatically redirects to the last, to the last one. But you can, you can have more control over this. You can have uh, aliases, for example, for your function version. So you can say that, OK, this version should be run in production. For my production endpoint, this other version is my development version. It can run on the latest uh, at whatever time, and so on. Um, all right, to wrap up, we looked at AWS Lambda. Uh, it's function as a service. It's uh, simple to set up. Uh, you pay as you go. You don't have any servers that cost you money if they don't do anything. Uh, and it's very scalable. And uh, performance from, at least for our use cases, has been very good. Um, serverless framework helps you with the configuration and deployment and testing, and it has a bunch of plugins to do different things. Um, some things, we're, we're still evaluating this. It, it seems to us that it, it doesn't support everything, of course. Typically, for these kind of tools that are more cloud agnostic, they don't support everything or the latest, greatest thing. So uh, another thing we see is that it, it does make the easy stuff simpler. Uh, it doesn't always make the harder stuff easier or possible. <laughs> like, for example, this, this uh, API integration, a, API gateway integration, um, Lambda integration, it doesn't support all uh, validation stuff there, for example. So in that case, we would have to go to either Terraform or this um, serverless application model for, from AWS. But it's perfectly possible to mix and match here, to have uh, most of your stuff in serverless framework. But if you need to go outside that, you can also include other cloud formation stuff directly into your serverless uh, framework configuration as well. So yeah, so we're still evaluating some of these, but we've so far been we've been very happy with the service framework so far. So, any sort of final questions or feedback? Feel free to contact me after the talk or uh, as well, of course. Hi, uh, really nice presentation uh, Thank and inspiring. You. Uh, just a question, uh, the um, uh, commands uh, you showed of serverless, mm -hmm. are those uh, open to, I mean, uh, the free ones, right? Because you uh, said there w would be uh, also a... Yeah, so it's, it's all, the, the, the serverless framework is free for use. Okay. Um, not sure the status of it's like open source or something, but it's, uh, it's on GitHub, I believe. Uh, the enterprise stuff is more about uh, like administration things, like you can um, put your configuration in the cloud and stuff like that, as far right. as I know. Uh, and the second one, uh, thank you, the uh, second one would be uh, how do you control the uh, uh, cost of uh, your lambdas? I mean... Uh, uh, good question. Cost control. Um, li right now we're just monitoring things. Uh, you can use, for example, the API gateway to do uh, to handle some of this for your HTTP endpoints. So you can you can give different clients different uh, rate limits and things like that. Yeah. But we haven't we haven't done this in practice yet. We don't really have that many users yet. But uh, we hope to get there. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? Yeah, over here. Hi. Uh, would you mind uh, giving a few more details about the uh, layers and sharing across functions? Ah, yes. OK. Uh, maybe I can, I can see if I have an example that we can show for the layers. Um, let me see if I can find something. 
So essentially, what you can do in the layers is you can you can package uh, dependencies like libraries in there, so you don't have to do that every time in in your function in your in your um, lambda packages because they can grow pretty big. Um, so let's see if I have an example. Um, trying to remember where. Okay, so in in our um, in our Excel thing, maybe. Mm. No. No, but I, I know that w one thing we have done is in some cases we we put things like um, we have a bunch of functions that do Python uh, transformations of, of uh, things using pandas. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the, but it's like a numerical library and it's fairly big. So we put this in in a layer, so we can just say we have a dependency on this layer. Uh, in our build process, and um, and that that means we can reuse that across a ton of different functions and not have to package that every time. So it saves us essentially instead of packaging like 40 megabytes every time we deploy a function, we package maybe 100 kilobytes instead. Yeah, so it's faster to deploy, faster to package. Uh, yeah. Um, not sure if that answered your question, but uh, <laughs> yeah. And you can you can also put these uh, layers on top of each other. So if you have multiple dependencies that build on each other, you can you can s organize this. Well, yeah. I, I just didn't understand the uh, uh, say how the layers are uh, placed in the oh, how package. They, how you create uh, like, them? Like like I, I know how how to how the layers are in say Kubernetes or in, yeah. in doc, Docker images, but I'm not yeah. sure how how is it in this case. How you how you create them? You mean or deploy them? How, how the layers are physically or done in the in the oh, package okay. or, yeah. or as, as you've said, it's a zip file. So how do you manage this way? It, it, it's essentially just a union file system. Essentially, I think you have a set of. Uh, files and directories, and it will put them all together into one big thing. I'm not sure what happens if like one layer tries to override fi files from the one below. I assume it will replace them, but um, yeah, we haven't tried. It. We only have one layer in our in our uh, examples. Okay, so so the platform will take care about getting or figuring out which layers are common. For no, we role. we have to specifically create layers, yeah. And there are some pre-packaged ones, and then there's I think they think about having like a marketplace for these kind of things and so on. But yeah, yeah. So we have to specifically create the layers in in our case. Like in one one deployment at some point has to create a layer, and then others can reuse it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Seems to be done. All right, thank you.